journalism, I think a lot of it is about understanding where your readers or viewers or listeners are coming from, and then how do you meet them where they are? The one big change I think has been that the consumers of news, readers, listeners, viewers, have to create their own menu of news. And I think you have to actively seek out other points of view, otherwise in your feed, you're never gonna get them. Hello and welcome to Tuesdays from Morrissey, where we share insights from great thinkers. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Jonathan Kaufman, Pulitzer Prize winning reporter, author, and editor, currently serving as the director of the journalism school at Northeastern University. Jonathan, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Adam. Prior to Northeastern, you, you were the executive editor at Bloomberg, over, overseeing 300 reporters and editors worldwide covering business, health, science, education, and international news. How did your time at Bloomberg shape your worldview? Well, one thing I think that's really good, um, I mean, I'd worked before at the Wall Street Journal, the Boston Globe, um, and at Bloomberg, there's an incredible emphasis on speed and accuracy. And I think that's frankly something when people ask, how has journalism changed? I mean, the speed is the big change. And so um, I think it was a, a chance for me not only to do great reporting and and lead really some great teams of reporters who who did very well and, and broke a lot of news and, and did a lot of good reporting and writing. Um, but then when you move to academics, right, it's a slower pace. Um, and uh, in fact, I remember one of my first meetings at Northeastern, uh, all the deans and directors were around a table and they wanted us to come up with a one paragraph uh, vision statement um, about our, you know, the School of Journalism or whatever. And so I was about to leave on a trip. So I said, can I get it to you tomorrow afternoon? And the the dean next to me said, no, no, uh, next spring. So the, the timing is different, obviously, but I think one of the things that has changed is that universities are having to move a lot faster. Um, and certainly we see that with our students, whether they're journalism students or, or other students, um, you know, they're living in this new journalism ecosystem where the news is coming at them all the time and we need to respond. So, you know, we're adding new courses all the time. I'm teaching a course in a couple of weeks on the campaign where we're going to be taking students and sending them out to do interviews and, and speak to voters and so forth, very much tied to the news. So I think in a way, working for a place that was at the cutting edge, I think, of where journalism is going, you know, helps inform both how we function as a university, but also for the students we're teaching. You mentioned speed is changing. I'm curious to learn the things that haven't changed. When you're bringing in a new class of journalism students, what do you tell them about the role of journalism in society? Right. No, it's a great question. I, I think that what, what has happened is the students are great at technology, right? I mean, they can they can take videos, they can put stuff on TikTok. They're very nimble in that sense. What they don't know are the traditions of journalism, the, the kind of things that don't change, um, which are ethics, which are fairness. Um, one thing I think that that is an issue is that because everyone under 40 and increasingly all of us live online, live on our phones, the idea of having to go outside, introduce yourself to someone and interview them in person is something that, you know, is a, is a new world for these students. And, you know, we even have when we teach photojournalism, the first assignment the professor gives them, she's a former journalist, you have to go out go up to 10 people, uh, take their picture and get their name and cell phone number. Because that's what you do when you're a journalist. About half the class drops out between the first and second week. because And it's not because they, it's almost like they're uncomfortable doing it. They're, they're not used to it. Um, but again, I, I think it's important not only for journalists, but I think for anybody these days to go out and interview or really talk to someone who they may disagree with. Right. I mean, that is our big political issue. And so I think those are the bedrock things, um, you know, accuracy, fairness, openness, getting out of your bubble. Those are the things that don't change. And, you know, we try to harness the technology to serve those ends. Were there any events or stories that really lit your spark around journalism? Yeah, I mean, I think there were there were several, I guess, two in particular. Uh, one was um, I was able to cover um, the Tiananmen massacre in China in 1989. Um, I, when I was in, uh, right after I graduated college, I was based in Hong Kong for a local Hong Kong newspaper. And then 
uh, I became a foreign correspondent. And a lot of that, um, I think, was shaped by my dealings in China. It was a great story. But I think what 1989 told me uh, was it gave you a, a clear view of the repression, the stress that people live under, and also the courage of ordinary citizens. Um, and so I think when I look back at my own career, I worked as a foreign correspondent um, in Germany and Europe, um, in Beijing, um, you know, traveled around the world as both a reporter and as an editor. And I think that experience of, of seeing kind of how governments try to control people, but also how people fight back, I think is, is something. The other thing is that I've always been interested in questions of race and class. And um, early on, I did a story about a, a 10-year-old girl, African-American girl, who lived in Baltimore. And it was a story about what it was like for her growing up in a community, a, a pretty tough inner city community, um, where more than half the men were either in jail, on their way to jail, had just gotten out of jail. And, you know, obviously a lot's been written about that, but to be able to see it through the eyes of a 10-year-old girl, I think was a revelation for me and I, I think for many readers. And that, I think, whetted my appetite for encouraging stories and doing stories about, you know, uh, inner cities, about poor folks, about people of color, and again, the struggles that families go through. Um, I, I think those are two things that I look back on because they took me again out of my comfort zone, talking to people I maybe never would have talked to, and I think um, was really illuminating. You know, one of my past guests was a PhD in mythology, and he was like, "We don't actually live in the world; we live our stories, and our stories about the world." How has it been for you? Like, you know, when I hear you tell that story about the ten-year-old girl thinking about, you know, there's stories she's telling about the world. She's there are stories their family is collecting about the world or telling about the world. And then there's obviously at the societal level, like how has that been trying to break through those stories when sharing some of this news? Well, I think, again, you know, I, I started out my career working for The Wall Street Journal um, before it was owned by Murdoch. And it, it's you know, it was a business newspaper. But in fact, most of the things that I wrote were about um, um, were about, you know, uh, uh, poor people, uh, racism, discrimination. And that was a good experience because your typical reader of the Wall Street Journal is not coming to the newspaper for that, right? They want to know about business. The editorial no. pages are very conservative. So the bar was higher. And, you know, you always had to ask yourself, what can I write in my story that'll somehow break through whatever story they have in their head, right? Journalism, I think a lot of it is about understanding where your readers or viewers or listeners are coming from, and then how do you meet them where they are? Look, I think right now we have an incredible case of that on campus, in society, over the Middle East and over Gaza, right? Everybody has really strongly held stories. The Palestinians do, the Israelis do, American Jews do, sort of however you um, divide it up. And one of the things I've seen on our campus in my classes is that the ability to listen to the other story is really important and it doesn't happen enough. And to also understand that there can be many stories, right? I mean, you know, you, you in that case, you have two people on the same land with very, you know, compelling histories. How do you, how do you begin to understand that? So I think you're right. Storytelling is important. And I think it's how we organize the world, right? Whenever I'm writing a story or now that I write books, I'm, I'm trying to write it not as fiction, but like fiction, right? I want you to turn the page. I want you to watch the next segment. I want you to be engaged. I want you to listen to what I have to say. And to do that, you have to be thinking, okay, where is the reader coming from? What do they know? What do they not know? How can I um, reach that person? When you talk about what does somebody not know, something I've, I've experienced from journalism and then your work also mm -hmm. is in order to cover current events, you have to understand the past and you have to present the history. What through lines or themes have you seen that have changed over time? And I'll call it human nature. And then what do you see? What have you seen that's remained consistent? Well, you know, I, I think one of the things that's striking to me is, you know, the world is more complicated than we think. Uh, one of my mantras when, when I was an editor at the Wall Street Journal, um, both in the U.S. and then I was based in Beijing, um, was to encourage reporters to embrace the complexity of, of what they're writing about. And frankly, I think as a country, that's something we need to do more of. 
everything these days is kind of binary, right? You're, you're for this or against that, or countries are good or they're bad. But once you get out there and start talking to people, um, you know, you, you, you hear these anecdotes, you hear the stories, you see people face to face, and you realize, even if you disagree with them, um, you know, this is their point of view. And you need to ask yourself, um, how do I persuade them? Or how do I reflect that point of view accurately in, uh, uh, in whatever I'm writing? So, so I think, you know, complexity is something that I think runs through history and, 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 and runs through um, journalism today. Um, I, I also think that the other idea is of choices. Um, I think we need to understand that, you know, people have choices they make. Um, moral choices, financial choices, and so forth. And there are these decision points. And I think one of the things or one of the ways to engage readers as a journalist is to make them think, oh, that could be me, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's one reason why I tend to write about ordinary people. I mean, I have huge, I have huge admiration for people who cover Washington, you know, and, and cover campaigns and cover politics. I get that. It's really important. I read those stories. For what I throw myself into, and even in my books on history, I've done this, is I want to find the person I can connect with or I can recognize or the 10 year old girl who makes me think, oh, I'm going to see the world in a different way. And that's something I can connect with. Um, and I see that with my students. You know, when you talk about, you know, big events or, or, or famous people, that's one thing. But when you talk about someone who's got to make a decision about what to cover as a story or how to deal with an ethical problem, students are like, oh, okay, I may be facing that question in my own life in a few years. How can I think about it? You mentioned you do a lot of work around the concept of race. How do you think about the role of identity in like how we live our lives and how we look at the world? Right. I think there's, you know, we all have multiple identities, right? Um, you know, I'm an American, I'm Jewish, I'm a father, I'm a professor, I write books. I mean, there are lots of identities that people have. I, I guess like a lot of people, <clears throat> I understand the importance of it. And I think being aware of identity, you know, and, and the antenna that you have about it, I think is important. At the same time, <clears throat> I think there's a growing feeling that we need to kind of I'm not saying dial back the identity, but not uh, explain everything or blame everything based on identity, right? So, for example, at one point I was a foreign correspondent in Germany when the Berlin Wall fell and in the years afterwards. And it was very easy, I think, for American journalists, including myself, you know, who were Jewish to go back and go, we would know all about the Germans, right? You know, the Holocaust and World War II. And, and, and that was something that I think was reflected in a lot of the reporting. Well, over the years, and I just went back to Germany um, uh, to see old friends and, and old colleagues there, you know, Germany turned out a lot different um, than many of us thought uh, back in 1989. In many ways, it's been a leader in, in kind of as the liberal country um, of Europe. And when you talk to the Germans, they've thought about their history and they've discussed it and they think about their identity and it changes over time. So I guess that's one thing I think we need to be aware of when we're talking about identity. It's not a fixed thing and it's not all that you are. And so if we can be open to the fact that people change and that their identities change as circumstances change, I think that's the that's the way the world is moving. You can't just fix it at one point. What risks do you see in the way people are being educated about news today? You know, I think about, you know, a lot of times you don't hear people referencing a Bloomberg article. You hear people referencing a tweet or an Apple news clip. I, I, one of the good things about teaching I've discovered is that you're constantly in front of a focus group of 20 year olds, right? In other words, as journalists, we live in our newsrooms, we talk to people, we have all sorts of studies, but there is something about being in front of a group of young people who, when they say they get their news from TikTok, they get their news from TikTok. And the students are really smart. Um, and one of the things I've come to realize um, as, a, as a baby boomer, um, is that people do get their news differently. And that's not unusual. When I started out in the business, uh, you know, newspapers were very dry. They were very fact-driven, uh, one fact after another. 
and one of the revolutions our generation brought um, were, you know, a different kind of storytelling, feature stories, anecdotes, mm -hmm. um, questioning of the government, right? All these things that people didn't know about previous presidents, we then got to know about uh, Richard Nixon, Bill Clinton, um, whatever. And so um, the news always changes. And I think there were two responses, right? One of them is journalists can sit there with their arms folded and said, no, the old way was the best way and I'm not changing. The other is to say, well, okay, this is the new world. How do we reach those readers, those listeners? Um, so for example, I think you've seen with the development of podcasts, right? Podcasts didn't exist maybe, you know, 10 years ago, and now they've become an incredibly effective way of communicating. Um, I listen to them. I know all the students listen to them. So we have to think, how do we tell the story well in a, in a podcast? Um, in the same way, I think there are many people, I would include myself, who think, you know, the height of journalism is a 5,000 word story on the front page of the New York Times, right? Um, and you win a Pulitzer Prize and everything is great. Well, the reality is that story today may be better told in a thousand words with photos, with a data visualization, with a podcast that you click on and link to. And it's not good or bad. It's just the way the world has changed. And I think in the same way, any company has to adjust to, you know, what the consumer wants. I think that's what journalists have to do. The one big change I think has been that the consumers of news, readers, listeners, viewers, have to create their own menu of news. It's too easy these days with algorithms and everything else to just get your news, right? So I would teach a class at Northeastern and everybody would know a lot about Bernie Sanders, but they wouldn't know anything about Donald Trump. They would know all about MSNBC, but they would never read the Wall Street Journal editorial page. And so part of what I, I, I try to tell them is you need to create, you need to curate your news. So you got to make sure that, you know how an Amazon, when they say, when you buy a book at the bottom, it says people who read this also like that. And there are other books they recommend. I sometimes think at the end of stories, it should say people who disagree with this story, look at this other story. And, and I think you have to actively seek out other points of view. Otherwise, in your feed, you're never going to get them. Um, and I think that's a really important thing and an important change we need to address. Yeah. Is it hard? I mean, you, you said you've covered Europe, you've covered Asia, you've covered the Americas. Are there certain trends and topics you're watching closely right now? Well, I think right now, I think the rise of authoritarianism is a huge one. I mean, if we go back historically, when the Berlin Wall, Wall fell in 1989 and then the Soviet Union collapsed, um, I think there was this sense of triumph in the U.S. I mean, certainly, you know, everyone thought, wow, we defeated communism, capitalism wins, and, and everything's going to be um, uh, great and, and very different. And I think that was true for about 10 or 20 years. Uh, but since then, we've seen new challenges and new divisions, um, whether it's religious or, or economic. Um, but I guess it is striking to me when I was just in Europe that when you talk to Europeans in Germany and in Prague and, and elsewhere in France, for sure, you know, you hear about the rise of the far right and these challenges to democracy happening in Poland, happening in parts of South America, happening in the Middle East and happening here. So I, I think that is something that we need to keep an eye on. Um, the other thing I think is a real disillusionment among young people. Um, and I, I, one of the things that I've sensed, and I, again, being with students so much, you see that, is that students seem these days, certainly before um, Biden dropped out of the race, there was kind of this despair almost among students. And they talk about this kind of sour mood where they, you know, they have student loans, they're not going to be able to buy a house, they feel the political choices aren't good, climate change and all that. And, and I, I find that worrisome. And I, I think that, you know, it's important. I mean, look, every generation has faced challenges. Every generation has felt, oh, man, the world is screwed up. What do I do? But there's always been a kind of sense of, well, OK, we're going to fight back. Or when it's our turn, we're going to make things different. Um, and so I've been troubled to feel that, that students don't feel that way. I do think whether you agree with the politics or not, it's pretty clear that um, what's going on in the Middle East and what's going on in the U.S. presidential election does seem to have galvanized people. 
And then when I was in France during the French elections, and there also you suddenly saw the threat of the far right mobilizing people. Um, and so I, I, I think there is a way where maybe young people are now feeling, okay, it is our turn. Things are not going to be bad forever. And, and we want to get more involved. Um, I'm going to be exploring that more this year because I'm, I'm trying to see whether that really is going to take hold or not. Yeah, two topics that I've been really focused on, and I'll, I'll reference the authors that lit my spark around. And one was I just recorded an episode with Dr. Corey Keyes out of Emory. He's one of the leading researchers on the science of human flourishing. He actually wrote a book in the 90s with Jonathan Hyde titled Flourishing. And then his more recent book is called Languishing. So people struggling to build a life of meaning, prioritizing happiness over functioning well and fulfilling their roles in society. That's kind of one piece. And you working with young people and then also with your global view, I think you have a, a, an interesting perspective. And then I, I've been reading a lot of Scott Galloway's work, particularly I, I've been sharing a lot of his article, America's War on the Young, mm -hmm. talking about how um, housing as a multiple of income is going up and education as a multiple of income is going up. Uh, some people are writing about, you know, workplaces changing there really isn't a question in there, but I'm curious on your, like on that cross section, you know, building a life of meaning coupled with some things that really threaten upward mobility. Right. Yeah. I, I look, I, I agree with all of those points. I guess part of it is um, in the end, it's going to be up to Gen Z, Gen Alpha, whatever those generations are kind of post millennial um, to address that. And I, I do think that it's interesting. I've got three, uh, three kids. They're all out of the house, but they're also my little focus group about what are, what are young people, what are young people thinking? And I think when you talk about a life of meaning, that's really important. And I think I feel very lucky in that I, I chose a profession and was able to succeed in a profession that allowed me to explore issues I cared about, right? Um, but I, I think that there, there needs to be, you know, everyone needs a purpose. And the purpose of life is not just to, you know, go to good restaurants and, and you know, um, kind of be able to relax and, and work-life balance and all that. Uh, some things are hard. And I think that, again, one thing I take comfort in, um, in what's going on now with the U.S. election and also with some of the discussions of issues globally, is that these are big issues. They're important issues. And, and young people are engaging them. And I think our job as both journalists, but also as as professors and, and academics is to give them the tools for that. Right. I can't teach them what to think. That's not my job. My job is to tell them, OK, if you want to understand something, let's talk about the history behind it. Let's understand what this leads to. Or if you're going to be doing something, let's make sure you have the skills, whether it's coding or, you know, using AI, you know, to be able to do that. And I, I, you know, again, people talk about colleges and what's going on there and congressional hearings that <clears throat> attack colleges. I really like the people I teach. And my sense of young people is that they're very idealistic. Um, they're trying to learn. They want to understand things. They've got strong opinions. And I'm very hopeful about that generation. And I do think then to help you know, remove some of the obstacles, whether it's housing or <clears throat> health care um, or participation in things. Um, you know, the baby boomers are hanging around a lot. You know, Joe Biden, I think, became sort of an example of that. And I'm curious <clears throat> as a journalist, but also as someone, you know, who's a baby boomer, whether people will look at what happened to Biden and say, you know what, maybe it's my time too. Right. Maybe it's my time to step down and clear the way for, you know, for for younger people. And I don't think that would be a bad thing. You know, I mean, I certainly think about it. Lots of people I know are thinking about it. You know, there is kind of a generational baton handing off the baton um, that's going on. And um, and I, I think, you know, we're, we're recognizing that it's time for that. And I think this may end up turning out to be kind of a pivot point, um, both for the country and, and maybe for other parts of the world. I want to go from a little bit of current events to the past and in, in one story in particular. In 2020, you released Last Kings of Shanghai, the story of two Jewish dynasties that helped create modern China. Why was it so important for you to research and tell this story? Well, you know, when you're a foreign correspondent, uh, your life is basically going to these various countries and you almost parachute in and then you're covering 
whatever, the coup, the catastrophe, whatever's going on. <clears throat> and then um, I was lucky enough to then be, I was sent to China um, by the Wall Street Journal uh, based in Beijing um, with a bureau that, that I was running. And we'd spend a lot of time in Shanghai. <clears throat> and so one day when I was in Shanghai um, with my family, actually, we were walking along um, and visiting an old part of Shanghai. <clears throat> Excuse me. We were visiting an old part of Shanghai and um, in this alleyway, we saw these um, doorways that had um, the shadows of mezuzahs. Mezuzahs are a Jewish object that many observant Jews put on the doorposts of their house. Um, uh, it wasn't the mezuzah themselves, but the shadow of them and the nail holes that kept it up. There. And I found myself thinking, what is like, what are these doing in the middle of Shanghai, right? Um, well, as it turns out, they were left there by the 18,000 uh, Jewish refugees who were fleeing Nazism in, uh, in during World War II who found uh, safety in Shanghai. And so I kind of filed that away. But the more I began to look at it in my spare time, there were other uh, signs of Jews having been in Shanghai, including these two families um, that were immensely wealthy uh, before World War II, were involved in the opium trade, um, and, uh, and it really shaped a lot of what we know about China, and nobody really knew their story. Um, the communists had never talked about it. China had been, you know, shut off for a long time. Now it was seen as an economic rival, a political rival, but this history was kind of buried. So I just thought there's a good story here. And it was not only a good story, I think it's also one that does talk about how complex China is, right? So again, you have a country that these days can be very nationalistic, um, you know, very sort of at odds with other parts of the world, but at another point in its history was very open to the world, but it was also colonized. And these Jewish families were British imperialists, but they were also kind of driven by some sense of social justice because of Jewish tradition. So that's the kind of story I look at and think, there's a lot here. And I, uh, I think as I've talked about the book, one of the things I was able to unearth and talk about is the story of women, you know, women in these families and, and, and how they dealt with things. So it just opened a door and I think it's gotten a good response in part because it's a good yarn, but it also resonates in many ways with, with how China turned out and, and some of the challenges China faces today and that we face with China. I like the way you captured it. You said the story of the Sassoons and the Kadoris is also a deeply human one, one by one marked by personal triumph and tragedies, the narrative of ambition, resilience, and the enduring power of family. Right. No, that's, you know, when you, when you publish a book, one of the things you do beforehand is you go around to different publishers and editors and meet them and talk about your idea and kind of get their feedback. And, and I remember when I, I first started pitching this book, editors would say, you know, is it a Jewish book? Is it a business book? You know, and and I kept on saying, well, no, it's a it's a family book, right? I mean, it's about these families and then all the things that they do. But I think in everyone's life, right? I mean, you can look at anybody and you say, why did they turn out the way they did? Well, there was something in their childhood or their parents or the world in which they grew up. And, and in this case, the families were uh, very close knit, although they certainly had their feuds and their conflicts. Um, but there was a way in which the world that these um, these folks grew up in um, really shaped them. And, and I think that's frankly one of the undercovered things, having worked for the Wall Street Journal in business, is we don't look as much about the family background of business folks. Um, I'm doing a new book now, and and one of the characters in it is uh, Jack Welch, the famous head of, of GE, who was in his time probably the most influential and certainly best known um, CEO in the world. And again, as I get to know more about how he grew up in his family, a lot of that shapes his views later on. And I, I think that's something that is undercover when we write about business and, and always worth exploring. Like what, what world did these folks come from? Yeah, the characters in Last Kings of Shanghai, you know, you capture them so well, they're captured with a depth and richness that I almost makes it feel like fiction. Do you have a favorite story from the book? Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I think one of the ones that I, I, I guess there, there are two. One of them is that the Sassoons made all their money uh, uh, through opium. Basically, China was shut off from the world. 
uh, dealing in opium was illegal because it was a real scourge. People, the Chinese for sure understood how dangerous opium was. Um, probably about 12% of the Chinese population was addicted to opium back in the 1840s and 1850s. I mean, if you look at the U.S. now, about 2% of people are dealing with opioid addiction. Imagine it being six times worse. Um, but when uh, uh, the, the, uh, the West essentially invaded and then colonized parts of China, what they wanted was not so much territory, they wanted access to the Chinese market, like today. And uh, the market for opium was huge. And so the Sassoons, um, who had started in Baghdad, moved to India, uh, were technologically very savvy. Um, they did things like buy steamships instead of sailing ships so they could get the opium from India to China faster. They used the telegraph to uh, get information about pricing and so forth. And, you know, when I asked the Sassoons about this, um, the current family, they said, well, you know, it, it's like uh, cigarettes or it's like alcohol. It was a vice. But the fact is the Sassoons knew how dangerous opium was. They didn't use it themselves. Um, they, there were a lot of efforts worldwide to ban the sale of opium, um, but the Sassoons uh, persisted and basically uh, uh, were involved in the opium trade till like 1913 or so, when it was finally made illegal. And again, I think this was sort of a moral choice that they made. And it's very similar, I think, to the dilemmas that business face all the time, right? I mean, look at businesses in China now or dealing with Russia, dealing with countries. You know, where does morality kind of intersect with business decisions. And so I, I think exploring that was valuable. The other thing that I found really interesting was the role of women um, in this story. Um, we have to remember, this is like the 1890s, early 1900s. Women don't even have the right to vote. <clears throat> and yet the women in these stories and these families played an enormous role. They were almost like the front lines while their husbands were off doing business deals in China and making a lot of money, they were often involved with, you know, seeing China on the ground, um, seeing how ordinary Chinese lived, um, and got very involved in philanthropy. Um, and so Laura Kaduri, one of the women I write about, started schools for Chinese girls, because she believed back in the 1900s, early 1900s, that educating girls would help uh, China develop. And so giving those women a voice and, and understanding what they uh, had problems with. As a friend of mine said at one point, they kept on bumping up against the bamboo ceiling um, of limits to what they could do as women. Um, but how they overcame that, I think, is a really powerful story. How is it different for you capturing and unearthing history like this versus capturing and telling a story in a current event setting? Well, you know, they're both, um, they both involve a lot of the same skills. The difference, I think, when you're talking about contemporary history is you can talk to people, right? I can interview them. I can go back and forth. I can ask them follow-up questions. Um, when you're doing history, you're relying on letters and documents and speeches and diaries and, and, and things like that. And there is a thrill. I mean, I remember for the, uh, the Last Kings of Shanghai, I was in the British Library looking through papers because these families eventually settled in Britain. And one of the librarians came up to me and said, gee, we found these letters. They were misfiled. They were in the wrong file, but I think it may be relevant to you. And they were letters written by Victor Sassoon, who was this larger than life figure in Shanghai, um, sort of giving parties all the time, incredibly wealthy, dealing with the Japanese and, uh, and, and the Chinese. And they were letters to his cousin very open. And it was suddenly like I could hear his voice, right? I could hear it wafting up from the pages. This is what he thought. One of the things I think every historian will tell you is we're still trying to figure out what it's going to be like 50 years from now. Will we be looking at text messages, emails, TikTok videos? Um, I think it's really going to change the way historians try to capture um, a, certain, um, a certain era. Um, so, as I say, I, I think that in a way, history is easier in that you have a written record and you can look at that, um, but it's harder because you can't grab the person and say, well, what were you really thinking? Um, interviews, I think, are great, but again, they don't have as much context. You're writing about what happened a year or two ago or a week ago or a few hours ago, as opposed to looking back 50 or 100 years and being able to pass some um, 
judgment about what what was going on and why. You mentioned earlier, you know, your own consideration of passing the baton, you know, in some capacity. You mentioned the the Jack Welch book you're working on. Um, you know, if you do step down in, in the next few years or so from Northeastern, you know, are there stories that you want to pursue in addition to the G Jack Welch story? Sure. I mean, there are. And I think part of this is maybe shaped by the experience of being with students and teaching them. You know, uh, history can seem very distant, right? Even though it's, I mean, I was in Germany, for example, recently, and um, we were visiting a concentration camp, Buchenwald, um, which I had visited in 1989 when I was there. And I went back and I was talking to the curator there. And I said, what's it like when you're dealing with high school students? And, and she said, you know, it's hard because World War II and the Holocaust is so far away. It's a long time ago. However, when we talk about the persecution of LGBTQ people, the students connect with that. Hmm. And, and that kind of got me thinking. And I think one of the things I think I sense in my classes is, you know, I think students sometimes need more history or they at least need to understand, you know, what were the 1980s like or what was it like when America faced certain issues and how did we deal with them? So the book I'm doing now is Welch's part of it. It's about the 1980s and understanding what happened in the 80s that led us to today. Um, and so I think there are other topics where um, beyond just a good story, I'm also looking for things that resonate today that may give us some idea of when America was polarized, when it was divided, when there were economic challenges, um, when the world seemed to be in such turmoil. How did people deal with that? Um, because I think it adds context to the current discussion and maybe gives people a sense of hope, like, well, OK, this is how they dealt with it then. What can we learn from that? Yeah, I'm excited to check out the book from the 80s. And I like what you're saying about giving people context to the world that they're living in based on shaped on the past. And especially this, uh, this next couple of decades will be pretty interesting. And we're kind of coming out of a few decades that have been pretty good and now potentially re-entering um, re a period that could be challenging. Right. And I, and I think history does offer some uh, uh, paths or suggestions of, of the way things might happen, right? There's that famous phrase, history doesn't repeat itself, but it can rhyme. Uh, and, and I think that's important. And I think it's also important for sometimes people say, no, we want to break with that history. It was always done this way. We want to do it differently. And and I, I think, again, that's that's valuable. Yeah. Do you think there will be a return? Like, you know, culture seems to have gotten so individual. Um, you know, a lot of our social groups, whether they're ethnic and religion, have kind of disintegrated to some extent. Do you think there will be a return to groups, especially if we face certain hardships? I mean, I hope there is, right? My line about college to my students always is you will never be in as diverse an environment as you are now. And I don't mean diverse just in terms of race or ethnicity, in terms of political views, economic background. You know, you have four years where essentially someone else is doing the cooking. You know, someone else is kind of responsible for your education. Your opportunity here is to talk to your roommates and go to various clubs or join different groups and to really understand what the rest of the world is like. Um, we have many international students, right? And, and so I think the reality is, as you say, people after they graduate college tend to drift into their own groups, whether it's, you know, uh, people move to Brooklyn or to Austin and they kind of hang out with people there or they move back to their hometown and in, in, in a red state and, and there. But but that but I and I so I think in college, what you want is to both be exposed to that, but also learn the skills to do it. Right. That's why I'm a big fan, whether you're a journalism major or not, in interviewing people, which is essentially talking to them. Because when you're talking to them and know you're going to have to write about them, you have to listen to them. And so I think there's an effort um, that has to be made to train students to do that between 18 and 22 in the hope that they continue it. And I think there is, I think people are eager to reconnect, I think. I think one of the challenges is it feels like politics intrudes on everything. Um, and I think we have to ask ourselves, how many of us have friends who we disagree with politically, right? It used to be you could disagree with people politically, but okay, we're not gonna talk about that. 
but we can talk about all the other things that we care about or, or like about each other. It feels to me, and again, my students tell me, you know, even on Tinder or, or, or dating apps or whatever, people now put up their political affiliation or who they're going to vote for. And, you know, I, I think that if you allow that to take over every aspect of your life, it does divide us or put us in our bubbles. And so I think on the one hand, people say they want to get out of their bubbles, but we really have to act to do that. And um, I think that's something that if we don't do it, it's going to be pretty worrisome. Uh, but I think if we do do it, you know, as I see, I mean, just one brief anecdote. I mean, I taught a course on politics and media in uh, last fall. And we talked about various issues that were going on, one of them being reproductive rights and so forth and abortion. And so uh, the class is, you know, Northeastern is a, you know, it's a, it's, it's in Boston, college students. So they're pretty much all, you know, in favor of reproductive rights and the right to abortion and so forth. Um, but we brought in a student from Harvard um, who was the head of the right to life group at Harvard, a young woman. And it was the student said later it was the best class of the semester because it was a real conversation. She was someone who, you know, fervently believed in what she said, but she respected the students. She wanted to talk to them. They were asking her questions. And in the end, I realized they were college students talking to each other about a, an interesting and difficult issue. I'm not sure if anyone's mind was changed, but my students, and I think she also reflected this, they enjoyed it because they felt they learned something. They learned that people don't all have, you know, horns and, and you know, they're acting like devils, that you can disagree and have a civil conversation. Um, I think we need more of that. I think we need more of that, too. That's a really great story. Jonathan, you've been really gracious with your time today. Before I let you go, what's the best way for people to keep up with you and the work you do? Um, well, you know, uh, Google solves everything. So I, I'm at Northeastern University. And if you Google Jonathan Kaufman at, at Northeastern, you'll, you'll find me. Um, or my books are on Amazon. I, I've written, you know, uh, a number of books, um, the Shanghai book that you talked about. I've written a book about uh, blacks and Jews in the U.S., which I think is very timely given what's going on now. Um, and I've also written a book about uh, Jewish life in Eastern Europe. Um, before and after World War II, which is which is uh, interesting. So um, use Google, and um, and uh, if anyone wants to get in touch with me, um, they can uh, get my email and so forth through Northeastern, and I, I always respond to emails. Awesome. We'll have links to your Northeastern profile and your books in the show notes, and thanks again for coming on the show. Okay, thank you, Adam. Thank you for listening to Tuesdays with Morrissey. That conversation was with Jonathan Kaufman, Pulitzer Prize-winning reporter, author, and editor, currently serving as the director of the Journalism School at Northeastern. What I enjoyed about the episode was Jonathan's invitation to listeners to get news from multiple sources and angles. This is particularly relevant in a time where a lot of people are getting their news from algorithms and tweets. If you enjoyed the show, share it with a friend, and we'll see you here soon. Thanks. Thanks.